Good morning or good afternoon, depends if you managed to eat before this or not. Um, welcome to this conversation um, with David Eskenazi, the author of this great installation, and Mira Henry. We, we all know each other. I don't think we need to do long introductions. Um, so, as you know, in recent times, sometimes we have conversations about the installation of the gallery, sometimes we don't. So it's usually up to the architect to do to choose to do or not, and in this case, um, the feeling was that it was an interesting thing to do. Um, so we're gonna have a conversation, I'm gonna be part of it for the first half hour, so then it's gonna get really good at one when I leave. <laughs> so then me and David really will go deep. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna get it going, for, with, 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 David will start speaking to give uh, a sense of uh, a context, uh, uh, the work that he did with the team. Um, and then we go from there. So, David Eskenazi. Um, well, thanks for coming, you guys. Uh, I hope you can hear and see us in there. We're kind of, it was a little bit of an experiment, see if those chairs can just keep going. Um, so, I, first I just thought, I wanted to kind of, uh, uh, kind of remind ourselves that, of course, when we do all the gallery shows, it's like a huge team effort, and so, um, I wanted to thank like some of the students that were laboring a lot are here. I think some of them are still coming. Um, and Hernan, of course, for the invitation. But it's always like a nice reminder that these things like bring the SAR community together a lot and that like, the students are really very giving. Um, and then there's a couple people that like we couldn't have done this without, especially um, Julie Riley and Eric Suramaki, who like helped us figure out how to come up with how to do this like water thing with paper and then um, uh, Keita Sato and Morgan uh, Noel Saboka who helped us really figure out how to like lead and, and make it and they put a lot of effort into it so thank you guys so much. Um, so I thought I'd start by um, maybe just reading the gallery description just because I thought it, it was nice because I wrote it and I was, I was trying to figure out what do you say first and I was like well I just want to say what I wrote so <laughs> I thought I'd just read it in case nobody read it. I don't know. Um, so I thought I'd just start with that. Okay. Um, uh, stories about doubles abound. The doppelganger, the simulacrum, the reflection cast from water surface or Eve herself. Uh, give the narrative a slight nudge and suddenly it's not merely a copy but an argumentative binary. In architectural terms, we compare the beautiful against the ordinary, art and craft, new and familiar, and responsibility against indulgence. Uh, where would we be without the filtering parables of right and wrong? Uh, a house bath appearing twice crudely, which is of course the name of the show, um, is a show about being on both sides of the problem. Uh, it's a vulnerable, vulnerable position, really, to be both right and wrong. Everyone can see our weaknesses and our aspirations are laid bare. Uh, so in the gallery, which we're in right now, appear two side-by-side -side instances of a model constructed twice. One is a familiar frame and panel assembly with graphic coding, that's the big one, um, while the other is built like a taped together paper model, which is <laughs> that one. Um, signs of architectural crudeness, leaks, stains, gaps, slumps, even yellowing and taping proliferate indiscriminately. Alone, they're craft-like and uncared for, uh, together and consistently deployed. Each instance of crudeness is buffed into a vulnerable sketch of likeness, if not strength. Uh, we may disagree whether the model's double appearance suggests strong opposites or near copies, but it's trivial anyway. A double appearance reminds us that we don't inhabit singular identities. We can always be more than one thing at once. Um, so when we thought of what to do in the show, we wanted to kind of do something um, that has been present in the work that I've been doing for a while, which is always somehow producing comparisons between things as a way to at least start a conversation. And in many ways, that's like the art historical model of like how you learn something. It's also, of course, um, you know, parables of good and evil tend to be about comparing right from wrong or your team is better than the other team or whatever. Um, and so I always kind of start there as a way to assume that that would produce this kind of in-between or this other place that we would um, think about. So when we did these, there's maybe, maybe just to start, there's like three things that were somewhat um, where, we, where this thing sort of starts from. Probably the first is that they share 
um, a stepped form, this like three-step form. This one I think is a little bit more obvious to see, but here you can kind of see the profile of it before it kind of collapses on itself. Um, this, uh, this one is a little bit, um, we were calling the kind of collapsing model or the, I forget what word we were using, but it collapses on itself. It's just made out of paper and tape. Uh, there's no other structure in it. So it's kind of, um, uh, what I've been calling like a poor model in the sense that like we look at it and it's a little bit obviously quite real in front of us because it's human size, but we also don't know like is it a model of something? Is it kind of a formalist idea about something? It's sort of a little bit vague. Um, and then this one's a little bit of a poor model in a different way because the crudeness here um, is a little bit less about the overall form and more about <laughs> its assembly system. It's a little wonky coming together. It looks like bad craft, good craft, uh, had a fight with each other a little bit. Um, and maybe uh, uh, the kind of poor modeling here, it's a little bit more real, there's water, but it's not really the way you'd build a building um, at that, this scale in a way that'd be totally responsible. So it's sort of vague as to whether it's still a model or we're modeling something or if it's quite real. Um, and then maybe the, the last thing, of course, is the paper, <laughs> which is kind of everywhere. Um, We've been working in paper in the practice for a while, mostly as a kind of material that we start on kind of conceptually as like, you know, when we print drawings uh, or images or something, um, it's a kind of substrate for all that. Uh, usually the, in digital world, that's maybe our screens are that kind of substrate. But what's funny about paper is that after the big crisis of like newspapers not being printed anymore, they thought they'd be really bad for the paper industry and instead of Amazon came along and now the paper industry is like bigger than it was. Um, and so paper went from like a surface that you print stuff on and look through to something that we look at or somehow materially performs um, beyond just kind of like in a book, but actually has to go out in the world and into whatever. And so um, the papers are, uh, they're actually all from like um, when you renovate your house. So the rosin paper is the free paper in the shop at SciHark. It's the stuff you put down when you paint or build your models. Um, if you paint your house and cover your floors, you probably buy the blue painter's tape too. So they're kind of like friends. Um, and then this is uh, a different paper that um, basically has nylon webbing in it and um, uh, prevents, uh, you know, prevents it from being ripped. Um, and then of course this one also has a lot of water and so it's a kind of a, a was a proposal we'd been working on for a while or sort of a model of a proposal um, to do a kind of temporary demountable bathhouse, but we we're calling it a house bath because it's not exactly the program of a bathhouse. It's more of like a leaky water bag system. So this was our attempt to like, how do you make a kind of paper bathhouse that would have water in it but be made out of paper, which is like a terrible idea, but there it is. Um, so that's maybe like the setup of the of the show to some extent, and um, so I don't know if I talk too much or if that's enough. You know, <laughs> I don't know how these things go. I think we're done. Okay, we're um, done. Okay, goodbye. Um, we have time for studio now. Maybe um, usually when in in these kind of conversations, I my tendency is to go to very simple questions and the more basic things. And I look around all our colleagues, the majority has done an installation here. And I see a couple that are gonna be doing one. So um, it's a little bit complicated because it's like going for Thanksgiving to see your family. This is what I've done with my life. <laughs> um, so it's a tricky thing. And, and for the students to be exposed to what you do. So I tend to focus in simple questions first, like, uh, to me, one of the most fascinating things over 20 years, and I look at Andrew who did the, the second one. First inside, I mean, Monica and Nader did it outside. So Andrew was the first one inside the gallery uh, to some people who done more recent ones. So my first question is always, because it has been all over the place, the approach is size. How you decide how much you want to occupy, how much you don't want, how much space you're going to leave. Because there has been all over the place. As I said, there are installations that fulfill everything. There were installations that were more a collection of objects. And yours seems to be somewhere in between. It's not really object, but it's not really the whole thing. And of course, all of them are proto-architecture in one way or another. But some of the authors decide to build something that is very close, what they aspire to do as a designer. And some other people take it more as a laboratory of this would be an ideal world that I would like my work to exist. So those two questions, size, decision, 
Uh, and the other one is, is this an ide idealization of what you would like architecture to be, or is more like a, I'm trying to figure out things on a level that eventually can take somewhere else? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question. Like, I think uh, what I've always loved about this gallery, um, at least the way that I've always understood it, is it's a moment to test something out. Um, think of it less, of, less exhibition-y and more uh, try out something that you haven't been able to try in a kind of practice space. And so um, it was important to me that it was like closer to the scale of something inhabitable, like it had an interior to it in some way. So it felt a little bit like a building, but of course, um, you know, it's, it's not it, like, because there's two and this one can inhabit, it becomes more of an object. So it's sort of in between, I guess, an exhibition and maybe a, like a little prototype of a building. Um, I think the size of it is always, you know, like when I've done a few of these in the past, I always just think like, what's the biggest thing that'll fit in the gallery? <laughs> and this time we wanted to, people to walk around it. So uh, you got your four foot um, <laughs> boundary that I was, I was asked to keep around. But um, uh, I think, that, you know, like the, the sense of it was again to kind of produce these in a way that are they models or are they not quite? And can we think of models almost um, at the size of almost a building or an actual building? Is that like, is there, a possibility of a kind of misreading of a building back towards some kind of model, um, both in the abstract sense of a building modeling an idea, but also in the sense that maybe it, if it was a little bit more literal, it would start to kind of look back like a like an actual bad model or something. Um, I think the, so maybe that's the size and maybe the situation, if that's what you're asking. So I think like the idea of it was to, um, like if it was just this, I didn't think it would be enough. Like it had to have its little counterpart that I'm, I think is generally the one that's forgotten about because there's a lot more stuff going on over here, um, which I kind of I like about them. Um, but that they sort of having the two sets it up a little bit less like uh, just a prototype and a little bit more like almost like an urbanism in the side of a gallery, like exhibition is urbanism, I don't know, in some way, like two things, I guess. I mean, oddly that, that you brought up Andrews because in fact that in his last, uh, studio, you're in some ways still working on some of, <laughs> some of the things that were presented, you know, and I think that was this kind of pretty powerful actually to think about um, kind of a, a life's work and work that, because this work has, it's it's been gestating for a long time, you know, and it's appeared in a lot of different instances throughout your work in writing and your teaching um, individual projects you've been doing. Uh, and so, I, I don't know, I think that maybe to, to kick it off, I would maybe also ask a kind of simple question, which is that your project is about a sort of double, right? And, and my first thought was, this already feels like a double of it something. Like, why? Why the two? Can isn't isn't the problem of double and the problem of of that not being of that that kind of um, the phenomenon of being between? Isn't it precisely because it kind of has to exist in one thing that makes it that much more complex and beautiful uh, to separate them? Like, not to say that there's um, a problem with it, but I'm I I my sense is that in each of them there's already that doubling taking place. Which is precisely what you said in your in your in your in your in your intro, but maybe we could talk a little bit about how these occupy kind of very different trajectories, like mental trajectory. In my mind, they have really different mental trajectories, and whether or not they, um, it, the, and I would say in in some ways, like this, it it occupies more of a space of abstraction or a place where to kind of resolve it further would. Uh, um, takes us to, um, I don't know, I mean, you had mentioned Gary, you know, this kind of, where this project could potentially go forward, and whereas this one, it is so present and complete in my mind, actually. It's quite complete, so complete that I, you know, you talk about it kind of being hesitant to describe it as fully a building or more of a proto-building. I kind of think that it's kind of itself. Um, so I don't know whether, and maybe we could just talk a little bit about the, the different like worlds of these two, um, um, maybe as to kind of tease that out a bit. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think you're right. I'm curious, like if, um, 
what you mean by like it's already a double i love that idea it is to I, me yes a double of, of like what would be the double oh, well it's it's a double of um kind of um kind of order and disorder or a double of of um um kind of high versus high and low order of a double of um you know something that feels very worked out and something that feels very precarious i mean it's it also brings in i mean it's it has a, a, a wet and dry, you know, it it's, it's, feels as if it's holding a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of internal, like, struggle, you know, which is what the double feels like it kind of offers for us as a, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like in, uh, doing like a frame system with panels feels very, um, like sacrilegious at Cyarch in a way, like in my own mind, like I feel like uh, we, you know, sort of just go with the plan and just extrude it and then just kind of figure out a sort of structural system that matches the form. It's something that even for me is something that like uh, feels even sacrilegious to my own kind of thinking. And so by, um, I maybe mean, weakening some of that stuff, it starts to do something different. But this one's very different, where it's like structural system, either A doesn't really exist, but if there's anything that's kind of keeping it together, it becomes much more of a kind of, this idea of like a mass or something that's like impenetrable and has either like an interior that we don't know or an interior that pushes outwards or it sucks things inwards. Um, whereas this, of course, is more of like a surface logic that's something that we're just um, inside of. Uh, I, I think like usually, maybe this goes back to the kind of like this idea of being on both sides of something. Um, I think many architects either like operate one way or operate the other way. <laughs> like I'm gonna be an architect that works this way or one that works this way. And in some ways I sort of see them as like, well, maybe it's okay to work. Like, I don't know, maybe you don't have to choose. <laughs> like, you could just do some things one, like, you know, depending on how you're sort yeah. of doing something. Maybe that answers that question. But I would say may maybe one interesting thing for to, to explore moving forward is, and I think you can assume that the double and duality are the same, but you can make a case, double is one thing, duality is another one, and maybe you have to do more duality. But there is something interesting about what you were talking about the frame, because the frame and the surface and extrusion, because you choose a weak frame. The frame is more, almost bending in every piece. So actually, there is a lot of relationship between the weakness. I mean, this one is weaker, if you will, but the, almost that one is, on, one would think, is on purpose, that you want the thing to become yeah. debilitated mm -hmm. by the weight of the water and so on. I know, but uh, to me, that's an interesting idea. There is, there, I would say, there is an intentional, sophisticated clumsiness. So, this, I mean, it's clumsy by design. It's not clumsy because it just happened. This one is a little bit more difficult to predict, but that one is more predictable. So I, I wonder if there is something that you can elaborate on that, on this idea of, of again, double and duality is one thing, but the other one is what I would call like a precise clumsiness. That's a nice way to put it, like the precise clum <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think when we're doing this one, we Which is another form of duality or double of contradiction, if you will. Yeah, well, we wa I was hoping this one would like sag and do all sorts of things. And then of course, as we were building it, I started like getting a little worried about it like falling down. And so I kept telling Kata and Morgan like more, more structure, like just add more pieces. I don't know, I don't want it to hurt anybody. Um, but it's still kind of in this, you know, like I was hoping like if one of you can like sh give it a little shake and surely like give it a little shake. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like there's a little bit of something, you know, to it that we were hoping for. And I think it's, I think in the end, it's a little bit of an experiment. It sags more than I was thinking it would. The paper starts to get a little bit more fabric-y than I was, um, expecting like you know here it's not so fabric -y. it still kind of reads like what paper does um so there was a little bit to it that i don't think we quite knew but i do think there was a um, i like the clumsiness maybe it's a precise just because i was it's in the title um crudeness i guess um and then this one i kind of knew what it would do just because i've done enough of these that i <laughs> was like uh it'll you know it'll kind of just um but there's a certain thing with these that like if you go too big uh, then you have to start introducing some sort of structure to it, otherwise the paper just completely collapses or completely becomes fabric. And so there is a sort of engine, a pretend engineering to it. I always think of these as like, 
if you know, like the um, your first structures class, at least I had to do this. I don't know if you guys do this, but you had to make like the bridge and it couldn't like fall down. You know, if you walk on it, um, these are like the way to fail your structures class. Like just do these kinds of things. Um, but there's a kind of like you have to sort of like uh, know how it's going to perform ahead of time a little bit. Yeah. But but that's kind of interesting that the one that is okay, much more weak material, whatever you know what it will do. This one is supposed to be more rigid. You didn't know what it will do. So the, I have two more things. One is I really love that it leaks. That I think that the leaking is important. I think if it didn't leak, it would be something else. And the other one, I don't know if many people pay attention to the opening to the slippers. And I want you to talk about the slippers a little bit because I find it a fascinating accessory to it. which uh, And I didn't see many people using them. So well, I was curious I, about I that I, too. I was like, telling uh, everybody so to I want to know, know, you know, like. <laughs> That's You well, were, weren't you? Okay, so a couple of years ago, we did a different proposal with, related to this project, and we'd included slippers in some of the images. And then um, I should tell, like, Jishan Wen, who's hiding back there, I think came in very close to being done, and she was saying, where are the slippers? You have to have the slippers. It's a bathhouse. I was like, well, I'm out of time. So I don't know if you want to build them, make them. And she did, which was so nice of Shishan. And so, um, but I, you know, we were like, they have to be paper. Um, uh, I, we were testing them. And as soon as we started walking in them, they just got destroyed. So they're, they're models of slippers, not the actual slippers. That's why they're on that little like piece of paper. Um, but we were kind of thinking of like with the bathhouse, like things that we would have to keep in the gallery. There's the slippers, there's the mop bucket, there's the mop, and there's the hose. Um, a to uh, you know come in and put more water in because as soon as you fill these up, they start to drip. Um, and then of course, once the water is on the floor, uh, it's got to go somewhere. And so the, the mop was the only thing that was the cheapest solution. So we bought a we bought a mop. Um, but that these things somehow have to like stay in the gallery as part of like the sense that it you know, both um, needs these things to perform. The slippers are a little bit less necessary to perform, but they're more maybe in a way like a little bit more scenic than anything. Um, but yeah, like I thought all three of those would come together. The only thing we were, I, was, I was hoping for was, a, was something for these. Like we would have to go in with, you know, this one doesn't have any uh, support pieces, you know, there's no like mop bucket for this guy. Um, no, you would have to have some sort of a rig to be so able to pick and like, it's like a big, crane. Yeah, something yeah. to kind oh. of help pick oh. and pull or something that some way of, you know, yeah, which yeah. is a different thing altogether, yeah, awesome. which is why I think this is more interesting. That's why you like this one. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you know, because this here you would have to create some sort of elaborate version of something that you would do with a physical model that's much smaller, right? But yeah, and I, so, like I think with the mop bucket and the hose and the slippers, like the slippers were a sense to kind of, um, you know, to try to produce an idea of intimacy. Like the idea that, of course, with this thing, you should go touch it. It's, you know, the water's still sitting in some of these and there's a little bit like a kind of flabby belly. And so you can kind of, you guys can like shake it right now and you'll feel the water in there. Um, and, uh, but it needs a lot of maintenance. So if once it leaks, somebody needs to be in here mopping up immediately <laughs> before it gets to the walls. Um, uh, if it's you know too heavy, like you have to do like there's a lot of like intimacy with the thing that I was kind of interested in like the at least the metaphor that of course a bathhouse is a place to be intimate with yourself or with other people that maybe we have that same relationship of maintenance and intimacy with the with architecture we have to hug it. I feel like this one's a little bit more huggable. I don't know. I haven't seen anybody hug it, but I kind of want to <laughs> hug it. Um, but I feel like this one's a little bit less satisfying if you hug it, but it's nice for like poking. Um, so I don't know, to me the slippers are a little bit of like that sense that like mopping, I feel like people that are of course maintaining buildings and, if, and cleaning them and fixing them have a much more intimate relationship really with the buildings. <laughs> Maybe not with architecture necessarily, but they sort of know the building in a very different way than we do. Um, and I always thought that was kind of, kind of an interesting place to kind of like try to bring together, let's say. I mean, the, the, the paper, Paper ruins water. Water ruins paper, right? So, like you, you use the word poor. You use the word what's the word on the wall? Crude, right? So um, maybe, maybe some some time before we would hear the words grotesque, right? We heard these other words that were somehow kind of meant to somehow be a sort of off, kind of off color, off at the edge of comfort or off the edge of comfort in, in, from an aesthetic stance. But maybe we can talk a little bit about 
the, the kind of desire for near ruin, the mm -hmm. desire for the poor. We've also had shows that talked about, um, what was Anna's show? It had the name at the end of it. It was uh, Rude Forms rude. Among Us. Rude, it was rude. rude. Anna's there. Rude. I just added a C to oh, it, so it's her. crude. I don't see her. Right. She's right uh, there. There's, there's the rude, yeah, right? Yeah, it was beautiful. You know, there's the rough, right? There, but what is, what, let's talk about it. Well, you've been implicated in this as well, Anna. So. I don't see her. <laughs> um, there, yeah, I think, well, you know, uh, maybe when I, maybe if we kind of back it up. It seems like nobody wants to do anything nice. Yeah. Nobody wants to do nice things. <laughs> we started with grotesque and couldn't go anywhere towards. <laughs> were, were, you were doing your work kind of grotesque. Right. I don't know if you use that word, but. Yeah, not anymore. But not yeah. anymore, but you did at some point. <laughs> yeah. So why, like so that what? was also a moment of like trying to, but it was very beautiful and kind of, I, so like, I guess. So um, is this, it's poor and very beautiful, beautiful. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So uh, I think, you know, there's a, maybe some, maybe to contextualize it with um, within Sired for half a second and outside for next, um, I think we've been in a moment at the school of like high production um, for a long time, both digital production and the sort of quality of drawings and models and all the things that we make is like super, super high, um, but it requires a lot of, um, careful attention and a lot of labor, of course. Um, and so there's been a sense to think like, could we just like loosen that up and still do, still find a way to do something careful and thoughtful, but without it always being um, maybe like the most refined version of something. Um, and in the case of this show, there's very little like digital to it in the sense of like explicitly digital, obviously it was drawn, et cetera. Um, and so there's also a sense of like, can we still make contemporary work, maybe? Um, without always it somehow um, implicating everything about, let's say, digital production or digital aesthetics uh, at the same time. So that's, that would be my two cents. I don't want to speak for others who've done rude instead of crude, but um, uh, I think there's, there's a little bit of like, can we just do this in the same way that we would just build a model at the desk without a lot of tools, without a lot of labor, without a lot, like too much knowledge, uh, like fancy knowledge. Can you do this with like less fancy knowledge? And by fancy, I mean, I don't know, like knowledge that requires, you know, three years of school or whatever. Um, th there's a little bit of, of like that sense of it. Um, I don't know if that's the same as what you guys were going for with, with Grotesque back in the day. But. Well, I mean, the, 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 that is an interesting conversation because I will say in one way or another that has been a recurrent theme in exhibitions in the gallery by different authors and different approaches. And, and it's interesting how the meaning of words change over time, right? Like, uh, there are many ways, but my favorite origin of the word grotesque, the, 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 one of the first times it became like a cultural application was somebody writing about the work of Goya, the, the Spanish painter. And the origin of grotesque was not necessarily something ugly or weird or uncomfortable, it was something that couldn't be cataloged with the aesthetic canon of a particular time. Over the years, we start to associate grotesque with something that, uh, you know, something like that. But the origin is not that. The origin is we don't know what to do with this. We don't know where it fits, so it's grotesque. So I think that's why I think there is a value in that. And in that, I would argue, like there are elements that you can connect within the field, but at the same time, there is an appetite to make it not fit in a particular period of time. So there is something interesting to me about that in the sense of many of the elements are recognizable, but they're connected in such a way that are not recognizable. Uh, or not, they're not recognizable, but they're put together in a way that you will not do it. Um, so to me, that's, that's very interesting. The notion, again, is a grid, but the grid became distorted by it. And, but the whole notion also about making it like a model, um, and, and again, and, and I really hate when we go into examples and so on, but <laughs> the early work of Eisman with the houses actually was the opposite. People start to think that there were models that were built, even though that was not the intention. But there was an obsession about precision. And that was, at that time, let's say 50 years ago, what we thought a modern bit built. Now, because the technology apparatus and all that, they had to be almost like an intentional unprecision to reclaim it. So the last thing I will say is it's a fascinating thing because if you look through history, it doesn't matter in what culture, in many ways, architecture was an aspiration of perfection. It had to do with religion and mythologies and all that. Now we have technology that are mathematically perfect, and we have an appetite to produce imperfection by design. 
And I think there is a little bit about that. To me, the, 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 the question I will have for you is, it, let's say some a strange thing happens, something, somebody come here and say, oh, David, I love your work. I want you to do a house for me. What does it mean this if it has to be deployed into an architecture that has to deal with the conventions of it? How much that can be carried? I think it can be, but are you interested in carrying them or, again, in, to design, again, that, that appetite to produce almost unprecision by design is an interesting one. So what that would mean? I, 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 that, what's next? You know the what's, the what's next question is always the hardest one. But I think... Uh, but, but, but I think it's important when we have a conversation, particularly with the students, we go, we're yeah. all exploring this mechanism that take us away in big, big steps, small steps, out of the conventions. Uh, so, I th you know, um, you wouldn't be able to get this permitted <laughs> um, uh, for many reasons. In LA? In, or, yes, definitely not I, I in Los Angeles. I give you a lot of countries that you can get away with it. <laughs> probably true, probably true. Um, uh, and yes, it'd be, you know, a very particular type of client that would want it, maybe a very particular situation. I, I think that the, um, I'm kind of interested in, in like the idea that it would have to require, uh, yeah, like a, like, a, like a different legal system or a different way of producing a kind of architectural project, let's say. Um, it sort of implies that a little bit, that if this were to go in the world, like it, you know, like uh, a structural engineer would probably fix it <laughs> a little bit, or we'd have to really like um, emphasize the sags in a way that like nobody will ever get hurt, um, that the water won't deteriorate anything. Um, and so I think like kind of building that imprecision and that sense of like take the thing falling apart, um, it is outside of like what we find acceptable. Of course, because we don't, you know, we have a big responsibility as architects to not kill anybody or injure someone. That's pretty, that's of course super important. And so there's a, there's a, I don't know, I think. That's the unresolved question with at least this one. This one to me is a little bit, like I kind of understand what it would be. It was just, this one would be really expensive. It's funny because yeah. this one was yeah. the cheap one to build. This was like under $100 and this was 10 times that or something. And so, but I think like how to do that one, I think it's just actually requires a ton of money and how to do this one would actually be not that much more than what it costs to just do this one, the one in the gallery. So I, not that money is really what you're asking me about, but I think that the, um, how these would translate to somebody's house where they want something nice is a is a good question. But I like I think it would be different probably. So it would sort of be about how do you build in precision or build vulnerability into something that of course still has to have meet its you know professional responsibilities. Um, so yeah, I think that, that I like I like that that you would have to have a conversation around vulnerability and and I mean. If you're doing a, if you're doing a single family dwelling, sure, there's certain right. But like maybe the question is, what kind of, what what are the things that you take forward if you are to scale, you know, and and wonder like there are there are the kind of material realities of this and the performance, which is, which is amazing, I think, and this idea of something that is, that sags and breathes and drips, right? And then there's the social component and the social agreement of this work, which is everything else that's around it, which is like this idea that you have to, there has to be something that's a little bit non-slip on the ground, right? There has to be an idea that there's uh, people that can, who are, who understand the, the thing so that they could care for it, right? There, and maybe there's uh, an idea about, um, uh, yeah, a sort of, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's, there's the kind of social component of the of the piece and house of, of, of what it would mean to scale something, and that's I don't know where that lands if that's in a single family dwelling or in some other kind of building type, um, that um, or you know collective space that where there where the kind of agreement is a part of the idea. Of, so let's say, let's say maybe it's slightly less the non visible, the more the performative side versus the visible. I mean I could think about. You know, I, 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 to me, they're like if you think about the Catan facade and their work, and maybe this idea of, of how a project could, 
you know, whatever, kind of assumes an idea about post-occupancy in the way that they're starting to design it, you know? And that feels maybe, maybe, maybe that would maybe come into the picture or something else. But there's also like, I think, um, there is also the, the kind of specter to me of a social agreement that is like slightly more subversive, like maybe more of a party, maybe more of a, maybe more of something that is, you know, like, you know, you've, you've talked about queerness generally in the, in your, in, in not specifically in the work that you do too. And, and that, that, the, that the work could also just be for, um, you know, uh, you know, people who are kind of have an agreement about it, you know, um, rather than it being a sort of, a sort of general, this is how I would make it into, like you would have to, yeah. maybe for who, for who and, and under what conditions, right? Which is, which is, I think is different. I don't know that, than just like, what does it mean to you know make it into a house, right? right. Um, like there are different problems on those. Yeah, yeah, and I think that you're putting both of those things out there, right? That there is the highly visible, the kind of material logics of what it would mean to kind of work at a certain scale. There's an aesthetics, yes, but then there's also a like a human component and and the way that people occupy and and collaborate to make something. That feels new to me in the sense that new in that, that you're trying to bring it into the conversation of what does it mean to like develop a kind of formal for, formalist project. So, you know, I think that, yeah, that I, I would say that that would need to somehow be present somehow. Yeah, I think it was really beautiful. <laughs> yeah, no, like, yeah, like, because I, I think that's part of the, you know, this sense of a binary that I felt like I've seen this sort of like, um, formal project, let's call it, and or a kind of like social engaged project that those things often are thought of as like, well, these are two different worlds. And I think, of course, we and always- social engagement via pleasure too. Yeah, um, but of course, like, you know, I think, I, I hope some, many of us probably agree that like aesthetics and forms and things like this are part of a cultural production that are pleasurable and are for people and are important to do. Um, and so I've always, I've never really seen them as like, needing to be separate. So I think like if there's a way that those that can touch more or imply one another, I think that'd be really great. Mm -hmm. um, I'd excuse myself. Congratulations to David and the whole team for a great installation. Carry on. Okay, thanks for Thanks, Renan. Um, I mean, this is meant to be a conversation, so I would love to open it up and see if other folks would like to um, either ask a question or just like participate in any way, yeah. Yeah, I really like um, when buildings like cut off people's bodies, you know, like, so even right now, like uh, we, at first I thought we would be sitting in there and then I thought, okay, maybe that's like too much. So, you know, f six of you, four of you are in there. You, right now we can only, can't see their heads, of course. Um, and so there's a kind of on, an, an, anonymity, <laughs> anonymity uh, to being in there because you can still be viewed. And so if you're standing, we just see a bunch of people's legs. Um, there's a little gaps between things, of course, that like allows little bits of views. Um, I think that actually produces more intimacy than when we can see each other fully, um, is when we can see like just little bits of each other and somehow not realize that that's happening. I don't know. So I, I yeah, maybe it has something to do with the slippers. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this relates to that in some ways. And I, I, just uh, David, a, a couple thoughts and then I think a simple question. But my, my first thought was that another form of doubling is a homonym, words that sound alike but mean something else. And the pairing that's been on my mind through your whole talk was uh, seem and seem, to, uh, to seem like something else and to make seams that join, that join things. And I feel like your project is playing at both sides of uh, both sides of that homonym in some really compelling ways, and on the kind of larger philosophical seeming like other things. Both of both of these manifestations are vaguely pyramidal, um, and so I found myself thinking: Do they seem do they seem like pyramids, or do they seem more like piles? And to what degree? You know, when do piles become pyramids? What is it that distinguishes a pile from a pyramid? Um, 
which led me to think one of the main things that distinguishes a pyramid from a pile is the is edge and seam, perhaps in another sense that you're working out here. And another kind of a, a kind of source of reflection for me was the a riddle. This three inch your seams in both in both manifestations involve a three inch inset or offset the three inch inset of the fold that gives what structural integrity to the cubes of, of let's call this the south, the, 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 the south, uh, the south, uh, south, man, uh, south double. Whereas in the north, um, your inset panels require this, require a similarly three inch Velcro wrap to stay the inset. And there's an, a nice play, I think, the, there's, your, your, your sense of structure that Hernan was talking about and the precarity of this and the, I actually think it's remarkable how much, uh, how, how much that, that, that building stands in a sense. I mean, we certainly read it for, um, for anyone that was alive long enough to be around for the controversies around Disney concert, the Disney concert hall, one of the first critiques of that building was that it looked like wet cardboard boxes stacked on top of each other. And actually, I think yours is an elegant, uh, elegant homage. But my, my easy question at the end of all that is, so if there are all kinds of doubling going on, another play on doubling is having. Um, and I wonder if I actually read these a little bit to the degree that many of us that have done projects in this gallery have imagined them at, relating to a project we hope to do somewhere else, we made a decision about scaling. And Anna's, for example, was really one-to-one -one in here, which was a miraculous move, you know, not easy to do. Um, I read these more actually at, I, contrary to what you were just talking about in terms of the kind of visual relationships, I read it as a precisely half scale. That if, it, that if I double both of these, they become occupiable in a, in a, very, in a very different way. This becomes, Dora, you know, passable. Um, so I wonder if, in terms, of you, in terms of taking this work forward, if, if you view that, that issue of scale and scaling as something that you'll continue to explore. Uh, well, those, I, really, that was very generous. The seem, seeming like seems, <laughs> seeming seems. Um, thanks for all that, Joe. But um, yeah, I, I think there's. Uh, I have had a slightly uneasy relationship with these because I think of their size. It's funny. This one, it does also to me feel like it's the wrong size. Like it, it's a model or something. Until I stand up there and I look down on it, and then and it, you see it's sort of like this like weird presence inside this gallery, and it feels like that's the right size from when you see it filling that space. Maybe, um, you know, like if we think of Anna's, like the, which was a kind of one-to-one, -one and it felt, of course, like the right size, but you were also always in it at the same time. Like there was no objective distance from it, um, maybe similar to Andrew's um, installation. Uh, like this one has that objective distance, so you can sort of judge it a little bit from being in it, being so close to it that you can't really see it, and also being far away enough from it to kind of imagine it elsewhere or in a sort of landscape. Um, and I, but I'm not sure exactly what the, what, if these are one-to-one -one or, or not. And I think their ambiguity right now is like maybe my interest in them, because of course, as, as soon as there's like a door and a window or stairs, like it's kind of locked in, and then you kind of resolve it, or maybe it feels a little too small or it feels a little bit too big, but it sort of gets, those things kind of get resolved. So I think probably this one, because it has a horizon line and that one doesn't, I think speaks to some sort of human, like scale about it because of that. that Maybe, um, I like your reading of it, that it's just like, it's half the size and it's, it just needs to double or something. I don't know if these are, I think these are wireless. Hey, oh, yeah. hey David. Wireless mic. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Two <deep. laughs> Um I'll be quick. Uh, congratulations, it's beautiful. Um, and thanks for the talk. Uh, I wanted to talk about model versus building a little bit more with a little bit of an observation and then, um, a question is because I'm curious about something. Uh, so I think one difference between model and building would be um, wall thickness or wall assembly, that in most models, not all, but in most, we would get a single piece of material to represent a wall. So maybe that's this, this uh, object here to my left. But here, these, you call them panels. 
Um, and I think that they, they bear a lot of resemblance to a kind of conventional drywall assembly, right? There's stuff inside of them. There's, um, there's a system for distributing the water. Um, they're multi-layered. There's fasteners and things. Um, and so that's my comment. And my question is, what is actually inside of them? <laughs> and how do they hold the water? Because we, we talked a little bit about water versus paper, but is there a bag? Oh, yeah, is there's a magic tubes? trick inside. Like, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's interesting to, to think about that too, because that's actually the, the the these were like they took a lot of work to build and always like six people, six students to make them, and it was a lot of because yeah, inside the paper is uh, there's a plastic liner in there to kind of hold the water so that the deterioration would be super controlled. So like there's specific holes mm -hmm. and like tubes that come out in specific places so that it was a little bit like it wouldn't deteriorate on day one. <laughs> Instead, it could sort of deteriorate over two months or whatever. Um, some of them have, le have like gotten real leaks. And so <laughs> there's like the, the real, the leaks that we intended and then like fake, like actual leaks. So we sort of get both. But yeah, it's a kind of like plastic ketchup packet surrounded by a paper ketchup packet that like go together and then they get, <laughs> and they're just like Velcroed to this um, nylon also ketchup packet because it's like a, it's like two pieces of nylon on both sides. Yeah. I'd like to see the detail. <laughs> yeah, it, but yeah, is it, it, there was a kind, there was a sort of assembly system like that was not as intense as a real wall assembly, but certainly had that layer of um, intensity to it. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on something you said, Joe. Um, you call these cubes. And I think that's a really interesting point. Like, we know that they're cubes, but they're clearly not cubes at this point. And I, I wonder about that. It, maybe going back to the doubling point again, or it's kind of a, a comparison. It seems like there's an interesting comparison between a kind of idealized idea about form or a diagram and its kind of material reality. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if that kind of doubling or that kind of comparison um, is in a way kind of critical in some senses or maybe an, an interest in terms of how uh, formal, formal ideas might begin to form or be realized in a kind of material world. But I also wonder in this kind of conversation in terms of its relation to the architecture or to the assembly, are there more idealized uh, layers to assembly, let's say, or layers which might reflect other kinds of material realities than the kind of uh, pure sort of um, uh, realization of paper and its comparison to, let's say, the cube. Um, and was that maybe some of what's going on here? You, you call out in particular this relationship between frame, uh, the exposed frame and the kind of infill panel. What was the relationship between those two systems and how did you work through kind of problems of material deformation reaction to that uh, kind of idealized form? Um, well, I guess I would, you know, I, I, what you're bringing up, David, makes me think a lot of like where sort of big influence on some of this is Andrew behind you, who of course would always talk about like architecture is like um, when geometry meets material, like material or something like this, or the, the consequence of one against the other. I just ruined it, I don't know, you, you say it better. But um, I always thought that was kind of interesting that of course like a cube is a piece of geometry, but it's sort of, you know, once you turn it into Architecture has to do certain things. It gets thicker. It does, you know, it doesn't have a floor, or whatever, um, or it has a floor, but it doesn't. Have, it's, it's Andrew. Andrew says they're five sided. If, as long as we're going to go with cubes, and Andrew, um, with, with these, like I always thought it was kind of interesting to kind of just like you have to actually they're very precise. Like you have to cut all these like squares, and then you have to tape them together very precisely. But what you forgot to do was like do it in a way where it would stay exactly like the drawing and so it's actually really hard to build these um, and I think the students that helped us know this because uh, like even as you're taping it together you have to like prevent it from completely collapsing until it's, you're done putting it together and so there's a kind of um, you have to it's sort of like uh, geometry becomes this like wild beast that you're like trying to kind of finagle even as you're as you're making it and, and I think that that's what the forms are so when I look at these cubes I see them more of like um, you know, uh, this exact problem of like, just like not, like poorly translating geometry into the material world. And by poorly, I mean 
letting it not always kind of maintain its original geometry, but the, its geometric description is still there because we know it's just six sides and then, but you build out a paper and then you get the, you get the thing. I think with this, you know, it, I think it's, it's, it was a little similar. We did a mock-up of, of it, of course, um, but a lot of it was like a lot of very sophisticated, educated guesses by, by the whole team of like what will happen. And, but we really didn't know. And of course, you know, my own worries were kind of present throughout. Like, is this too much? Is it not enough? Is it going to stand up? We don't know. We don't know. Um, but I don't, so this is a very personal answer. I think with this one, like the question of geometry is um, obviously somehow it's a little bit closer to its own geometric definition, but just like everything else, like things have thickness, even like the, the horizontal bars don't go right up to the top because of like the little bracket things and the thingy on top of it that present, prevents it from going anywhere. Like all of it is sort of, you know, kind of confronting, you know, what we used to call maybe the corner problem, like the kind of materiality sort of becoming something different. I think the only difference here is that it's not a kind of corner problem based on a geometric problem, it's a corner problem based on just like the wrong materials <laughs> for what you would want to do. So, yes, Andrew. I, I, you know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I said maybe just a couple of observations based on a couple of things that Mira was asking about and also um, Hernan's question about what would be the, the next scale of it. And I, I sort of thought, well, that will be solved and it may or may not be by you. It's, so it's interesting both to think of it, what it means for you, but also for the discipline. And I just remembered years ago, Kenneth Frampton giving a lecture when I was still a student about the reconstruction of the Barcelona Pavilion. He's talking about Mies. There's, of course, that famous description of Mies very late in his life, watching the roof being raised of the new National Gallery in Berlin, this giant black square, and him calling it one of the defining moments of his, of his life. But apparently late in life, someone had an interview with Mies and said, were you ever influenced by the um, you know, early Russian modernists? And he said, I certainly have, and especially not by Malevich. <laughs> and it's funny because, of course, there was something introduced in the black square that was extremely compelling, and Malevich was not the person to do it, and it floated there, so to speak, in, as, a, as a possibility, and the architecture comes there eventually, however many decades later, and so I think if, if we kind of go back a little bit, this notion, and, and Gary's name has come up several times, and maybe this gets to the question, I, I don't know if, I, if queer is the right word, but let's say sensibilities that have not been afforded um, a place, uh, that there's a lot of sensibilities in construction and tectonics and materiality that have been suppressed and put back and are not considered what we're supposed to be working on. And, you know, I think we would acknowledge there was certain work of Frank that looked at that. I think there's some examples from my own generation, but certainly your generation and, and maybe even younger. You could start to find quite a bit of this, things that ought not to be within the proper discourse of architecture, suddenly being a focus. I think you have a very particular take on it, and then you've brought it into these other cultural and social questions in a way that I think is going to you know, have legs. I think once, I think that's out there and you have introduced a strong enough idea that, well, it may be 60 years from now when some, you know, old guy near death builds a building and disavows any knowledge of David Eskenazi. But, but I, I think that, so I think Hernan's question is really important. And I think it's one that probably you have a vested interest in exploring, but I think the field does. And it, and it probably does mean, maybe what I was getting into, it's not necessarily, you know, Gary is talking narrow, if I could phrase it this way, narrowly about material reaction and the precise and expensive translation of that into tectonic structures. And it may be something more slippery than that, you know, actually putting in water. You know, maybe it has a kind of social and programmatic component and it's not just the, the translation of odd statics into reliable statics. Can I, can I add to, to that as maybe just a, um, not a question, but I think a, a reflection that I've had about the work that just has to do with its own poetics and 
it's um, because I think I think you're right. I think that it is it is about sort of material reaction, and, but 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 it's but it's slipperier, more slippery than that. And I think that um, you know, to your credit, David, I think that there is you've kind of produced a setting, and I think in terms of the idea of the seam and the seams, this also does seem as if it were a tent. It does seem as if it could somehow occupy somewhere between a, 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 wet, a wet sloppy party and a, the kind of a military uh, colonial outpost somehow at the same time, right? Which is a strange space place to be and maybe not, um, and I, I think that, you know, one of the very first things I read about that you wrote was a piece um, that began in the desert, right, and talked about the kind of scale of a of a of a sphinx, or a, right, and and the scale of the body to the to the object, and and I'm and when I first came in and saw this work, I was like, oh, we're back in the desert, you know, and we're back in that problem, you know, and we're back in that problem of the of the kind of. Um, of colonial outpost and the, the problems of measure and the ways in which architecture is is so connected to that as a as a space of knowledge, um, not to be denied, but actually to sort of to somehow let that also come into the room and breathe into the you know both the the kind of um, the kind of the inhale exhale of the project the beauty the um, you know the kind of the kind of fun but also the kind of weight and weightiness of it. Um, and, and again, why I think I'm so compelled by this, this, this side of the room is because I feel like I'm able to, to be in, you produced a setting for that, you know, across time and across geographies. Um, and, and I think simply because you're able to, you've lifted it and you've rendered it with material that has a sort of, uh, a, has a life outside of uh, rep representation, but actually outside into, you know, it's like halfway made with materials that, you know, the, the military would have been, as work uses and works on, half of it is made out of sailing material, material that has to do with nautical, you know, uh, technology. So there is a sort of like travel about it too. And I've, and so I, I just appreciate that, that space, the kind of, the, the kind of, the kind of story also that, that you've produced through this. So I, that's maybe my way of sort of sharing a reflection that I have on the work. I think that oftentimes I was reading a, a, a book, recent book by Tina Camp, and she talked about um, what does it mean to engage a, a work of art? What does it, engage to, it mean to engage work? And sometimes it's just about kind of writing with it or talking with it. And, um, and so I've, uh, yeah, this is maybe not a question for you, but just a way of talking at, with the work that you've produced for us. So if you want to share anything to close, but I also just want to thank you. Uh, well, that was like really, that was very beautiful, and yeah, I, I, a number of people have mentioned it feels very military. And actually, at first we were thinking of these water bladders to hold the water, which is actually something militaries use to move water around. And you know, I was thinking like, well, you know, a lot of queerness is taking like military aesthetics and like doing something different with it. But yeah, there's a the military part of it is a little bit like a, I, I don't know what to make of it. It's true, um, and the sailing part of it, I. I don't go sailing, but I feel like it should go sail into the world. So I think that that's, um, that's really beautiful. And Andrew, I also thought like your comment about how influence and how things kind of get figured out later um, by the discipline, not necessarily by a single person is a good reminder of how things work, which I really love that. Um, Oh, we have one more question. Oh, for, okay, Anna will be our last, our last question. Sorry, I have a question, but it's kind of like complicated maybe, and I'm not sure if, the, if, it, if it should be the last one, but um, I want to come back to the idea of this uh, bathhouse, uh, because of course, David, you also taught a beautiful studio last spring that a lot of the students in this room were participating in, which also had two things side by side um, in a space that is really important, historically speaking, for Los Angeles. Um, and of course the word queerly comes back up in this installation as well. And so when you talk about the, um, the kind of the leaking of this um, model building and then the bucket and the, the bucket and the mop for this wet ass model, um, like how does sex and desire come back into this? Um, I'm really interested to understand better because um, right now the way in which it's occupied is not really the way it's supposed to be occupied. Um, when we think about the legs that would be seen here, they would be most likely naked and half the body would be, of course, not on display. And this comes back to kind of 
neo-pornographic way of photographing something. And I'm uh, thinking back also about the way in which Mira photographed her exhibition where it was really through photography that we truly understood what the installation was about, which was about tone and skin and relationships of materials to bodies. And I'm really curious how you will photograph this space and whether that kind of, whether it will get really turned on, like in both ways of that, the meaning of that word, um, how the water will really begin to take over and how maybe a, a kind of a crowd of legs will uh, organize those photographs. Yes, um, all of like, all of my friends that came to this that are like super into bathhouses a little bit more than I am. We're all like, I love it. I can't wait to, <laughs> I, can't wait to get I can't wait to come back yes. when like all the architects <laughs> aren't here. And it's like, okay, great. And they're like, this is perfect. Actually, it does everything. It's better than a real bathhouse and yeah. blah blah blah. And I was yeah. like, when are we gonna it's do the it? Right scale. Yeah, and I was just like, <laughs> I was like, well, it's a you know, they're like, you know, they're like. But like the building has glory holes, but instead of like actual glory holes, like yeah, oh, yeah, great, yeah, 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 let's do it, whatever. Um, but I, you know, so, um, but I think the photography question is really important because um, there's the kind of the photography that the school produces, which is like the gallery, nice wide angles. We'll, we'll get those, the sort of documentary ones. But I, I was thinking a lot about actually about Mira's installation, um, which was so beautiful. And I think Anna's right, like the photographs really help us understand that project. Um, and so I think like two things. One, I hope everybody can come back. We'll, we're gonna do a, a water party at some point. I just have to figure out how to do that. Um, so we'll do that one and maybe document it. But I think we're also gonna try to bring in different performers. I've been trying to figure out how to do this. And, uh, photographers to kind of produce something where we'll turn all the water on, figure out, you know, like intimacy here is uh, you're on display. So it's, it, it, there's a lot to kind of unpack, but I was a little bit surprised by at least the few people who said this to me, like by their reaction, because they were like, oh yeah, this, this is ready. And the photographs that they took with their phones were very different than all the architects and they were better, no offense. Like, it's just like, well, these are better photos. Like, <laughs> let's just do this. Yeah, so I think, um, that's a really important question, Anna, and I, I, I do appreciate it. And it, um, I guess I wanted to say thank you guys all for coming, and I think the conversations are really helpful for me to kind of unpack, but I hope for all of you too, maybe to kind of make sense of what this thing is. And um, you know, so many of you were also my teachers and my colleagues, and so you're, so much of you in my head is in here, even though you might look at it like, oh. So anyway, but thank you to everybody and to the students and who helped it and for coming today. And thank you, Mira. Thank you.